John chapter 1, we're going to launch from there tonight. It's good to have everybody with us here, everybody with us online. We appreciate you and love you. Um, We're going to do something, I tweeted it today, that has not been done yet. Um, We are going to uh, give a double portion in this upcoming week's feeding. Double portion. And I found out that when the people get the food that we give to them, Americans would eat it all probably at one sitting. Um, But these people have learned food doesn't come easy. So we give them a week's worth and they stretch it out to two weeks, sometimes more than that. And um, that just breaks your heart. And so I just kind of got to thinking about it. And I thought, let's do something big for Christmas. So we're going to go back into some of the same areas that we have been with a lot of the elder folk that are really struggling. And um, I mean, the, the, the poverty is so high there, these older women, they cannot afford clothing. That's how bad it is. And so um, I talked to Michael about it. So we've made two big orders of food, and we're going to try to give out a double portion uh, in time for Christmas. And um, we're going to provide some little things for the, for the orphans in the orphanage, and um, it's good to see them smiling and happy and well-fed, well taken care of. You pray for them. Pray for that orphanage, and I uh, found out that they lost some of their support. And um, so just pray for them and, and uh, pray for the children there. We got a well dug. They finally hit water. And, and that's for the new orphanage that's going in in Catali. And uh, so that, that part is done. They, they, how many meters? Huh? 150, 160? Uh, 150 meters, somewhere around in there. So that's, what, 450 feet roughly? Close to 500 feet, maybe. Huh? Yeah, it is. Uh, deeper than what they thought they'd have to drill. They were planning on 60 to 80 meters and uh, ended up having to go down 100, 150, 160 meters. So, do what? Yeah, I know. We got lots of water in Missouri. So, thank God for that. All right, uh, John chapter 1. Uh, This is verse 29, when John saw Jesus, really for the very first time, he recognized him. Don't you think you'll recognize Jesus when you see him? Okay, and and here's what I believe. Uh, We know the Bible teaches us and warns us about another Jesus and antichrist. False Christs, Jesus said. Many false teachers, false Christ, many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. So the trick is, are we going to recognize the real Jesus or be fooled by the fake Jesus? Well, that depends. That depends on you. Do you believe what's in this book? And if you believe what's in this book, God, I believe God will not let you be deceived. I believe he will not. You don't have to be the smartest egg in the basket. You don't have to know all the verses memorized. You just believe what you read, but ground yourself, root yourself. Don't be like the seed sown on stony ground where you don't have any root. Root yourself, and that way when the storms come, and the storm's coming, and I may talk about that tomorrow, but the storm's coming, and when it does... God's people aren't going to blow down. They're not going to fall for it. So ground yourself with as much of this Bible as you can. Believe it. Even if you don't understand it, you don't have to make the Bible work. Any more than you kept yourself alive today. Okay? 
What is the saying? Only blondes have to be told to breathe. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, <laughs> only, uh, okay, I don't want to offend anybody here. Only blondes from Fredericktown have to be told to breathe. No. Yeah, I know. So, um, your body did a pretty good job today of keeping itself alive, did it not? What controlled that? The DNA, the book in it. That's what controlled it. The book controls us. It's in our life. It's, it's alive and quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him. And I, and I believe that he had never seen him before. But he looked upon him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Uh, we started on this last Wednesday night, and I'm not going to recover all that, but I want you to turn to Romans chapter 11. And while you're turning there, uh, we'll go to prayer here in just a minute. Don't want to forget to pray, and we'll pray at the end tonight. I'm going to pray for some folks and some needs in people's lives, and for Kenya, and for our country, and all that good stuff. Um, but I want you to think... Mormon doctrine, and I was stunned when I found this out. Mormons believe this. Those who follow Finnis Dake, um, Dake was um, 20th century Bible idiot. The guy had some of the strangest doctrines I've ever heard in my life. Um, and I won't get into all that, but Dake believed essentially what the Mormon church teaches. That if you sin and you ask forgiveness, God forgives you of that sin and you're free and clear. However, if you commit that same sin again, God unforgives the sin that you committed the last time, doubles it back on you. Now you're guilty again of all your, that sin plus all the previous sins. Now, show me that verse. But he, and Dake boasted that he had that god literally downloaded most of the bible to his memory he could quote it frontwards and backwards he boasted about that um that god gave him instantaneous understanding of this that and the other now i'm going oh, i had to study i had to read my bible but dake believed that and so do a lot of charismatics uh those who follow his teaching the mormon church believes that Maybe some others, but they believe that once you're forgiven of a sin, if you go out and commit it again, that sin is unforgiven and God throws it back on you and you're guilty once again. Um, so is that true? No, because he said that the Lamb of God taketh away the sins of the world. What does he mean by that? Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessings upon these people tonight. Pray, dear God, that you'd give them refreshing in your house. Thank you, dear God, for sweet fellowship. Thank you for this book. This book settles all the arguments. It's right on everything. Thank you, God, that you've given us something to put our faith and our trust in. Bless the teaching of your word tonight in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. So, where did God put our sins? Once they're forgiven, what happens to them? Huh? Huh? They're washed away. Somebody else? He's forgiven them. He forgets them. Into the sea of forgetfulness, J.R. Cast them into the bottom of the sea, in the depths of the sea, he said. Okay? Um, and how was that accomplished? Remember what they did to Jesus' head. I want you to think about that during his crucifixion. I want you to think about that. And that's going to become relevant here in a little bit. Romans chapter 11, verse 26. Paul said, so all Israel shall be saved. Romans 11 is Paul wanting Israel to be saved. And that's where he talks about the, uh, the tree the, and the branches grafted in and so on. As it is written, there shall come out of Sion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And he said, verse 27, for this is my covenant unto them. And this is from Jeremiah, I believe. This is my covenant, Jeremiah 31. This is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. In fact, turn to Jeremiah 31 very quickly. 
Jeremiah 31, 31. It's a verse so good they gave it double numbers. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the date. It's not the Mount Sinai covenant. In verse 33, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. There's four things there. And, uh, but it's, and w under what conditions is God going to do this? Nothing. They're just going to believe what God said. He's not requiring the works of righteousness by the law. He's not requiring the conditions that were laid out at Mount Sinai. Not that covenant, he said. It's a different covenant. God is just going to forgive Israel. In Isaiah chapter 40, he says it. He said, I'm going to render unto Israel double for all her sins. I'm going to take them all away. So if God has taken them away, who has the right to put them back on you? Not even God will do that. Not even God. So, just because somebody knew you back at a certain time in your life, when you were in sin, you know now that you're forgiven. You have a conscience that's clear between you and God, and that's really who it matters the most. Somebody may not like you from back in those days because you did this and you said this and you were like this back in those days. If they don't like you and they don't love you and they don't care for you, that's fine. But your conscience is still clear because God has forgiven your sins and man can't put them back on you. He takes away the sins of the world. First John chapter three, turn there. First John chapter three. I've been sitting around all day waiting for this service. Had some good study time. Uh, pray for us. We're going to be headed down to Church of Many Blessings this Sunday night, 6 p.m. Uh, Pastor Ron Dagonia and his fine church. They've got some people in there that they want to know the difference between the King James and the other translations. And um, I'm excited. I've been working on a new presentation for that. Kind of putting, putting pieces from other things that I've taught into this one service. Pray for me, because I've got, what, like 20 hours of teaching on just the King James, <laughs> and i got to try to condense it down to about an hour, 30 minutes maybe. Not going to be easy. All right, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin, and this is what sin is, transgresseth also the law. For sin, and underline this in your Bible. Underline this in your Bible. For sin is the transgression of the law. Do not, and I repeat, do not let anybody from social media cast sins upon you that the Bible says are not sins or the Bible doesn't say anything about them. If God is going to hold you accountable for something, he wrote it down in his law book. And if it's not in the law book, you're, you can't be guilty of a sin that in God's eyes does not exist. And that's one thing that I, I really, really just gets me is when I see people casting sins upon other people, things, and here's what I like, things that they don't do or they say they don't do them. Knowing that you do them because you posted it. And they tell you you're going to hell or you're not really saved or, you know, they, they climb all over you for that sin. My question is, what are, what are they doing? I guarantee you they're not pure. Guarantee you they're not. In fact, the biggest mouths about your sin are the biggest sinners. They're using that as a cover for their own transgressions. And it just, it makes me angry. Um... So whosoever committed sin, sin is transgression of the law. God wrote it down. Verse 5, and you know that he was manifested to do what? Take away our sins and in him is no sin. The illustration of Moses putting his hand in his bosom. Jesus was in the bosom of the father. He plucked it out. It's full of leprosy, white as snow. That's sin. That's Christ the first coming. He then puts it back in his bosom. Jesus ascended back to the Father. 
to atone for man's sins. Once, now that he's plucked his hand out again, it's clean like his other hand because Jesus, when he returns, will return this time without sin. The Bible said he's not going to take anybody's sin away anymore. And by the way, how many times does it take for Christ to die to take away everybody's sins for all of eternity? Once. Not like the Catholic Church Mass that kills Jesus every service. How many Catholic churches are there in the world? A million? So you figure at least a million times a week, every week, Jesus is crucified all over again. That's an abomination. Uh, but anyway, so he said, and you know that he was manifested to take away our sins and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. We all right? Okay. All right. Anyway, I got three guys with guns. I'm not gonna worry about it. Whosoever abideth in him, but if I say duck, everybody duck. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. And think about this. So here's the question. Have you ever sinned since you've been saved? So what does that mean? Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Does that mean that because you sinned, you don't abide in Christ, you're not saved, you're not born again? Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Later on, he says in 1 John, he says, that which is born of God cannot sin. And I have heard people, people have called me very distressed. Pastor, somebody told me that if I sin after I'm saved, I'm not really saved. And they quoted that verse. He that, he that is born of God sinneth not. So it must mean that once we get saved, we don't sin again. And I said, hold on a second. Which you are you referring to? Which me are you referring to? The outer me or the inner me? The inner me is born again. The inner man is born of God and does not sin, is not held accountable, is a new creature. Old things passed away. That's why this body is going to do what? Pass away. It's passing things now. <laughs> Amen. It's going to pass away one of these days. The new man is renewed every day. It's brand new all the time. And it doesn't sin. And that's the part that I care the most about. Not the outer man. The inner man. So when he says, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. He's talking about the inner man abiding in Christ. The difference between the spirit and the and the flesh, the spirit is always willing. But the flesh, what is it? It's weak. Okay? So he took away all of your sins. How did he do that? Turn to Leviticus. David said, great things, uh, great peace have they that love thy law. He's shown us great things from his law. Leviticus chapter 16 this was on the Day of Atonement. So once a year, once a day, there was a sacrifice made, a daily sacrifice for the sins of the people. Once a year, there was an atonement made for the sins of all of Israel for one year only. One year only. And they participated in that and there were certain things that Aaron, the high priest, was supposed to do, supposed to follow the book. That's, what, that's why Jesus said what he said. Lord, I come in the volume of the book. It is written to me to do thy will. So he's following the book, doing what God said. And so on the Day of Atonement, they selected two goats. And he said in verse 7, He shall take, Aaron, the high priest, shall take the two goats, and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats. Did they cast lots when Jesus died? They shall cast lots upon the two goats. One lot for the Lord and the other lot for the... And the King James uh, introduced a word into the English language. Scapegoat. You ever been made a scapegoat? When your sister and your brothers got you in trouble and you didn't do it? Um, I 
counseled with a man one time. I went with him on his probation hearing, and he actually lost the hearing, had to go, had to, go to prison for about six years. But he told me how he got started in drugs. He said he was about 11, 12 years old and walked in on his two bro older brothers smoking marijuana. And they figured, well, since you walked in on us, you're either going to join us or you're going to tell mom and dad. And dad was going to Bible college at the time. And uh, so they put it in his mouth and told him to draw in. And he said, that's what got me going. They got me high that day. He said, I've been high every day ever since. So they made him the scapegoat, okay, the fall guy. But this word was introduced now into the English language, into the concept. Lo, the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be, and both goats represent Christ. They represent, and, and I want you to think about this. He's the lamb of God, but on him was laid all the sins of the world, though he himself knew no sin. So when Jesus is separating the sheep from the goats, we know the goats are the bad guys. Well, Jesus took on the bad guy, okay, in a, um, in a type in a shadow. Um, so both goats are going to represent Christ because both of them are going to fulfill the function of removing the sins. One goat is going to pay the price with his own life. The other goat literally is going to take away the sins. Look what it says. The, verse 10, But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. So they took the one goat. They would cast lots on these goats. The one on the right, let's say the one on the right got to be the Lord's goat and the one on the left got to be the scapegoat. They would take the one on the right and they would take him and he is to be sacrificed. He's going to be killed. He's going to give up his life. Now, did the goat do anything wrong? No, he's, that's why he's a picture of Jesus. Jesus did nothing wrong, but he took our sins and paid the price for them with his own life and his own blood. Then the other goat, they are going to let that goat go. Now look at verse 20, same, same chapter. <clears throat> Here's how it was done. This is, I love this. I love the law and seeing and understanding the foreshadow. When he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place, which is where the Ark of the Covenant is, and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. Now remember, this is the one that he's going to let go. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat. So, the, they bring the goat to Aaron, and Aaron is holding in a sort of a, in a, in a allegorical type, he's holding all the sins of Israel in his hands. And he lays his hands on the head of that goat. And what he's doing, he is transmitting the sins of all of the Israelites, all the Jews, onto the head of that goat. Okay, that's what he's doing. Because that, look at what it says. Verse 21, Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat. Now, remember what I asked you all ago. What did they do to Jesus' head when they crucified him? What did they do? The crown of thorns. Thorns, we've covered this. Thorns represent, in Genesis 3, the curse for Adam's transgression was thorns. Adam, when you till the ground and plant your seed, thorns and thistles shall it bring forth. Okay? In other words, I'm not going to make making a living easy on you. And I don't care what job you have, it's work. 
its work. Whether it's physical work or brain work, the brain gets tired just like the body does. Amen? So, no matter what it is, so thorns represent the curse and the sting of sin. Makes sense, doesn't it? Sting of death is sin. Strength of sin is the law. So they put, when they put the crown of thorns on Christ's head, those thorns represented every sin that you committed. Every one of them. Transferred upon the head of Jesus Christ. Did they do that? Did they put the thorns on him after he died? Before he died. So he's where, and crown represents what? A king. Authority. What rules over us? The law rules over us. Death rules over us. Okay? Our enemies rule over us. Sin, lust rules over us. We don't, we don't, our body doesn't get a choice in what it does and doesn't do. It sins. It'll do it just about every time. It's obedient to sin. So the thorns laid upon Christ's head represent all of our sins transferred upon Christ's head. Now look back in Leviticus. So all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities into a land not inhabited. Hell. And he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. So if your sins were laid upon the head of a goat, if you're an Israelite, and your sins are laid upon the head of a goat, and a man takes the goat 20 miles out into the wilderness, into the desert, and lets him go, he walks back, but the goat stays. Where are your sins now? Gone. Are they ever going to catch up with you again? No, they're not. So the purpose of the two goats, one was to pay the blood price of innocence for our sins. The other was to take away our sins. And that's what Christ did. Now, where did Christ go after he, after he died? Where did he go? Lower parts of the earth. With our sins. Okay? He left them there. Never to come back on us again. Somebody say amen. I love this. Now turn back to the Hebrews 10. Because, well, okay, well, that's a pretty good deal. Then why did God have to send his only begotten son when it would be cheaper and easier to just have a goat do it? But goats can't really do it. Not really. Not eternally not everlasting and i you know i i i see this very plainly by the time christ came god made it absolutely impossible for them to have the the day of atonement ceremony in israel made it impossible because part of the requirement was the goat that was slain they took the blood in dipped hyssop in that blood and sprinkled it seven times on the Ark of the Covenant. When Jesus showed up on the scene, there's Herod's temple. There is no Ark of the Covenant in it. It does not exist anywhere. Nobody knows where it is to this day. Nobody did. Disappeared after Josiah. We have no idea where it went. But God made it impossible for Israel to continue to have daily sacrifices and day of atonement sacrifices to take away their sins, God made it impossible for them to fulfill the law that way. Only Christ could do that. So Hebrews 10, verse 1. For the law, having shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things. All your Hebrew roots, friends, have it backwards. Totally backwards. Because they believe that they're supposed to go back and keep the law. As much of the law as possible. How much is that? And I guarantee it's different with everybody. And not the very image of the things can never, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Can't do it. 
for then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. Conscience means your knowledge that you did wrong and that you're guilty before God. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Why? Because they had to do the ritual every year. For Verse 4, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should do what? Take, see those words? Take, I picked this verse for that reason. Take away sins. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. The bulls and the goats and the lambs and all of that stuff could not take away sins. But in those, uh, verse 5, where, wherefore, when he, Christ, cometh into the world, he saith, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not. So which is better, sacrifice or obedience? That's what Samuel said. To obey is better than sacrifice. And, and he meant that. But who's the only one who obeyed Christ? So he, Samuel's already declared to every Jew that Christ's obedience is better than all these sacrifices we do every day and every year. Amen. Amen. Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Think about this. When Christ came the first time, the body of his first coming was the little baby. We're about to celebrate that. Born in Bethlehem, lived 33 and a half years, died on the cross, rose again the third day, ascended up to the Father. That's the body of his first coming. What is the body of his second coming? Us. All y'all, all y'all, all, all born-again saints, we literally are the body of his second coming. I love that. A body has thou prepared. God's preparing the body right now. So, verse 6, In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering, and burnt offerings, and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure in them. The word pleasure here is used in Isaiah 53. It pleased God to bruise him, meaning Christ. Uh, had, hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Verse 9, Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. And that... that has multiple applications. He took away the old covenant to establish the new covenant, but he had to take away the old one first. He taketh away the old mic and is going to replace it with a new mic, but he has to take this one away first. I have to die in order to get the new body. I have to. Every one of us are headed for a coffin. Okay? Uh, or a burial at sea, or, or rapture, whatever. But we're all headed for that one of these days. We're going to die. And there's no way out of it. But that is what brings, when he takes away the first, he will then establish the second. So John said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. He took away the first, that he could establish the second. Um, verse 10, by the which will... We are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That's a phrase introduced into the English language. Once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. The Catholic Church is nothing more than a continuation of Old Testament sacrifices. Only this time they're sacrificing in front of an idol which is forbidden in Acts 15. You're not supposed to do that. The Catholic Church continues every day. There's a mass somewhere every day of the week, especially in monasteries and convents. There's, there's a sacrifice of the mass every day. They're killing Jesus all over again. And that's a contradiction 
Every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. And the Catholic Mass can never take away your sins. But this man, in confessing your sins to a priest, won't cut it either. God never told you to do that. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down on the right hand of God. And he said, I'm done. I'm done. It's over. I'm not doing that again. Amen? Don't have to either. Now, Revelation. Wow, I'm actually going to get through with this tonight. That's amazing. That means I'll have to study something else out next Wednesday. Yeah, we are having service next Wednesday night. That's the 23rd. Revelation 5, verse 11. This is where Jesus is introduced. So think about it. What John did in, or yeah, what John the Baptist did in John's gospel, John chapter 1, was actually a foreshadow of this right here. Revelation 5. Because in Revelation 5, there's a book that needs to be opened. No man can open it. It's in the right hand of the Father where Jesus just happens to be sitting there. Wow, isn't that convenient? He doesn't even have to get up. I just, here, hand me that book, Dad. Here you go, son. Open that. That's for you. Okay? Verse 11. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. The number there is 10. 10 is for dominion, authority. The law hath dominion. That's why there's 10 commandments. Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power. See, that's why the number 10 is there. Power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Did you count those? Yeah, I, I thought you graduated third grade. Seven, right? Which is the Democrat six. Okay. If the Democrat says we're only going to raise your taxes 6%, they're going to do it 7%, right? Uh, anyway, seven things there. Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. John introduces him as the Lamb. And then we have the 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, which is like in the millions Millions of millions and billions of billions saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb. They're no longer introducing him as the lamb. He's continuing as the lamb of God. And he's always going to be, always was the lamb, always is and always will be the lamb. Amen. Never. And that's how we know our sins are always gone. It's because the lamb is always a lamb. Revelation 7. After this, this is, this is where it comes in. After this, verse 9, Revelation 7, I beheld and lo, a great multitude. We're not alone. We're not that small of a number. Not when you add up all the faithful saints since the creation. It is a great multitude, which no man could number. Of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And I used to go, of course they had a palm in their hand. I got one. That's a joke. There's a song the cathedral sings years ago called Palms of Victory, and my wife's going... What does that mean? Palms of victory. No, it's not that palm, dear. It's the palm branches. Now, why? What's the significance? If you were to just take a guess, they got palm branches in their hands. What is the significance of that? What does that mean? Nope. Uh, you're close. Tabernacles. When, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, what were they doing? 
They had palm branches in their hands. That's why you're close. That's why they call it Palm Friday. Okay? Or that's when you slap Jackson with the Palm Friday. Okay? Palm, yeah. Sister will do it. Trust me. Sister will do it. Right, Matthew? Sister will palm you. So they, they carried palm branches in their hands. And it's a four, it's, they're waving it in your face. They're telling you something. Okay, now I'm, I've never set a date. I won't say I never set a date, but since 1997, I ain't set a date. But I do know that the Feast of Tabernacles is the unfulfilled feast. Passover is fulfilled, Pentecost fulfilled, Tabernacles not yet. He was supposed to be called Emmanuel, God with us. But who called him Emmanuel? Nobody. Not at his first coming. He was not ever called Emmanuel at his first coming. He will be at his second coming. So the palm branches, I believe, represent, because they took palm branches and made booths or tabernacles. The idea of a tabernacle, it's, we get the word tavern from it, and we would say, okay, that's a bar, but that's not really how it was used 150, 200 years ago and beyond. A tavern was a place, it was Motel 6. When you pulled in, when you were traveling on your camel or your donkey or your horse or whatever, and you made it to a little village, there would be a roadside tavern there with beds and meal and something to drink. And that's where travelers could spend the night for a shekel or two and get up the next day and move on. It was a temporary dwelling place and it's to remind us that everything down here is temporary this body is a temporary dwelling place for god who is literally with us right here in this room right now amen he is with us and he's not lying to us in anything he said not once so that's that's the significance of the palm branches so, th so they're waving their palm branches. And um, it says in verse 13, One of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them. The Lamb shall feed them. He's gentle. Lambs are gentle. Lambs are not mean animals. Okay? You don't have guard lambs. Watch lambs. Okay? Nobody has pit bull lambs <laughs> protecting the house. Okay? For the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them. You don't have to be afraid of being thrown into the lamb's den. Amen. Yeah. Ah, the lambs are wooing me. Shall lead them. It's been a long day. Shall lead them into living fountains of waters and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Your labor is not in vain, people. Your belief is not in vain. It has a purpose, it has a reason for it. And one of these days, the Lamb is going to wipe all that away from us. Amen to that. I'm looking forward to that. 